Hi, I'm Vinny Todorich, folks. Your good intentions have been stolen, but don't worry. I'm here to help you get them back. You may be soft and succulent at the beginning of this process, but hang in there. Before long, you will be lean and mean, guaranteed, just like the guy on the other mic today. As the Friday show, you know what that means. We bring someone in with a vast amount of knowledge, and they just lay that knowledge on us. This guy has been on the show several times. He's also a friend. I consider him a friend. Uh, we've met several times in person, usually at low carb events and that kind of thing. We've we've been on the same stage, not together. They put us on at different times because no one wants me and Peter on the same stage at the same time. And I can understand why. I'm talking about the sod father. I'm talking about the the guy who doesn't believe that cow farts are killing the planet. I'm talking about none other than Peter Ballerstadt. How you doing, brother? I'm doing well. Thank you, man. I'm all revved up for this. <laughs> hey, you should be. I mean, Peter, you know, you're one of those guys where I wish I could have been, I wish the mics were hot five minutes ago. Hmm. Because that's the conversation the world needs to hear. And I'm kind of hoping we can capture some of that I, I literally said to you at some point uh, let's go i gotta turn these mics on right because um sometimes i think we have more interesting conversations sometimes i wonder if we don't want the world to know what we think uh, you ever well i yeah i was given three primary keys by a colleague and that's sort of my most important messages number one um you know public health will be harmed without sufficient animal source foods right number two um there's no sustainable food systems without livestock agriculture in general ruminants in particular and number three these foods are part of our cultural heritages wherever those heritages spring from right and and so if if I can find somebody that agrees on those three points, then maybe we could avoid some of the, you know, other distractions and, and, and press into those issues. You know, it's interesting that we're going to talk about this today. I didn't plan it this way, but I'm doing back to back Friday episodes with uh, Dr. Bill Schindler, which will come out right before this show comes out. Right. And, you know, you know, I, I hate the argument. I, I'm so sick of talking about how veganism is not the right way to go and that kind of thing. And, you know, people go, why do you have such a hard on for those people? I don't. I don't have a hard on for vegans at all. I just hate that there's some vegan doctors out there who are lying to people and they know they're lying to people. Mm -hmm. You know, um, when when Dr. Esselstein or Dr. Greger, or to, to a larger degree, uh, over at Harvard, I um, um, uh, can't think of his name right now. Um, Wally? Yeah. <laughs> Wally. Will it? <laughs> Walter Willett. Just, they're making stuff out of whole cloth. Walter Willett is a very smart man. He knows that he is not telling the truth. My question, and when Nina and I get around and have a drink, we always sit around and go, What's he thinking? Why is he doing that? He knows that he knows the truth. Mm. Right. Mm. So I'm never mad at vegans because at some point every vegan figures out, oh, wait, this isn't working. Or at least mm. we know 85% of them will stop being vegans within the first six months because they go, well, this is stupid and this doesn't make sense. So that's good and fine. The problem I have is when we keep pushing this this narrative that we know is a false narrative right and we make up these lies along the way about this whole thing and then i get a guy like bill schindler on and he doesn't go back ten thousand years you know he's an archaeologist he doesn't go back a million years he doesn't go back to he doesn't go anywhere close to you know what we became you know the homo sapiens we became right he he starts before Cro-Magnum. He goes way back, mm -hmm. 3.5 million years. And that's why I had to do two episodes. He went 3.5 million years where they found a rock. 
Now, how they found this rock, I don't know about you, but Africa is a big continent. Hmm. They're roaming around, they find this rock, and they realize it's a prehistoric, well, all rocks are prehistoric, but they figure out that it's a prehistoric tool. Hmm. That somehow, this early man, that was half the size that we are now, took this rock, and shattered it against another rock and made an edge, and then used that edge to cut into bone marrow. Hmm. You see, back then, the only time, you know, we were gatherers back then. And the only time we got anything close to meat was scavenging what another animal had already killed and consumed. Yeah. yeah. And, and Dr. Jessica Thompson talks at one point, she describes um, bone marrow, like finding a stick of butter in a landscape devoid of fat. Right. And that's the grassland. Yeah. You know, the grassland is not a, a, an environment that's rich in food that can sustain us of itself. It has to be converted primarily through ruminants. And yeah, evidence is that we st our, our roots are back in the grasslands. And I'm making the case that our future is rooted in the grassland as well. Um, but we have to get through this phase. And, and um, yeah, I, th I think that the idea that even e what makes sense to me is you had a clever primate that was using a hammer stone as chimps will do today to they do it to break open fibrous material to get at something inside so okay it, it it's not a really advanced technology but then every once in a while you get one of these flakes that breaks off while you're using it to break open the bones and so at first and now people who observe chimps i'm told the chimps ignore the flakes right they're, they're in the way Right. Uh, for for some clever primate, perhaps you can imagine them examining this sharp edge and then figuring out what they can do with it. But they were already using tools to access all the material they needed to build a bigger brain. Yeah. And to subsist on a smaller gut that would free up the energy to support the bigger brain. So I'm um, I'm absolutely convinced. Um, for what it's worth as a forage agronomist, a uh, ruminant nutritionist, that our roots are as scavengers who became apex hunters. That's exactly the way he explains it. And I even said, you know, from that, what I'm guessing was happenstance, where this one ape went, hmm, wait a minute, that just chipped off and it's got a sharp edge. And he used that sharp edge to, to actually do exactly what you said. They think because they can see scarring on on ancient bones of animals where they were crushing through with these pieces of rock, right? And getting to the marrow and enjoying that, that marrow. And, you know, I said, well, how long did it take? And he said, another million years, right? So none of this stuff happens overnight. Right. These animals had some one animal had a cognition and he had a thought. Mm. Right. One animal. They might have not all been Rhodes scholars. I don't think Rhodes <laughs> personally even existed back then. Yeah, I'm pretty sure not. <laughs> because look, I mean, I look in our society, there's people all over the world. There's very smart people, and then there are very dumb people, and then there's people like me that's right in between. And most of us fall in the right in between. I'm yep. not see, I'm not discovering anything, right? No, no. I'm no. a right in betweener. I'm just yeah. reading what someone else discovered. So I know I, I know so many people that are much smarter about forage agronomy and ruminant nutrition. And I know a lot of people that are much smarter about human nutrition and metabolic health and exercise uh, yourself and fitness and all those. I'm just trying to be a good pipe, right? I want to be a good channel and convey that information. One, one um, professor that I ran into last fall said, we need to stop building silos and start building lighthouses. Right, that, that our current system is all about reductionist approaches getting, you know, narrower and narrower and deeper and deeper knowledge. Well, we're rapidly approaching areas where they don't exist 
in isolation that you have to be able to connect the dots and and so that's what i'm seeing and and the exciting thing for me is we have a really good story if we can connect the dots and learn to tell stories better and that's going to come as we get more and more people aware of all these connections but peter don't you think that we had many of these dots connected and they became unraveled we disconnected sometimes i feel like you know the more technology we have the more in reverse we seem to be going or is it just me feeling that way yeah i i, I think that you know as i mentioned before um the the technology that permits me to sit at my kitchen table and access all the literature i used to have to go to the library to access also allows us to watch cat videos right so it, it is it the technology or is it the choices that we make with that technology and and i'm aware of what many people are saying about screen exposure for youth and all of that and i'm not denying any of it what i am what i did recently come across was gary taubes talking about the 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 book that's going that he's working on that follows the one that hasn't yet come out right he's he's already working on the next one and uh for that he's using what is it chat gpt right to translate the old german research articles that wow. go back before like the 20s and the teens back when people were you know doing some really important work and you know if you've listened to him he talks about how world war one and world war two especially really just completely closed down that community of research that was taking place in human metabolism and endocrinology and and nutrition right um as well as many other things so Okay, you can you can do that with it as well as other things. I found a statement in a book, um, which I wish I could remember the title now uh, about meat or something like that. It's a it's 1933. It was a publication from the Meat and Livestock Board in the United States, and in it it says science has now proven that meat does not cause disease, and then lists a whole bunch of diseases that people still think it causes and then says and in fact has been shown to be instrumental in the treatment of those very diseases 1933 so yeah it's it's a really good question to ask how we got from there in 1933 to at least 1980 and we could go beyond where people were saying no can you know too much meat is bad for you you know, and then what's too much? Well, you know, and then some people say any amount is too much for you. Right. Well, I mean, there's all of these narratives we have to understand, as you were saying, all the people that know the truth yet maintain the falsehood. And hopefully, you know, that's the 2% on the one end of the bell curve. Meanwhile, we've got to engage with the, you know, 96% that's in the middle, right? Because they're the persuadable folks, right? Or maybe it's even narrower. I'm, I'm encouraged by the idea that a tipping point need only be 25%, not do you, 51%. Do you really feel that about a tipping point, that, that it can yeah. be that low? Yeah, I um, think so. Explain that because I, I'm all into, you know, I, I, folks, there's a great book called The Tipping Point that came out probably 30 years. Are we that mm. old? Here? 30 years? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, we are. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, God. Was it that? It's maybe longer than that, right? Yeah, I don't recall. Yeah. But, you know, there's a great book and, and it makes a lot of sense. The Tipping Point and tipping points can happen. But I wonder, before you explain why you think it can happen at 25%, which I won't disagree with you, because I would love it to happen at 25%. But I feel like there's a freight train coming down the track, telling a different story, which, you know, when you have the mayor of New York, you know, a city that we all follow, and you have the schools in California, Again, 
a, a state that we all seem to follow when it comes to trends, at least. Mm -hmm. And people can think what they want. That's, you know, you know, Madison Avenue has been telling us what to think my entire life. Mm -hmm. And long before that, when they're saying things like meat is murder, meatless Monday, vegan Friday, you know, do we have a chance? Do, do we really have a chance when they're teaching generation after generation that this stuff is horrible for your health? Right, right. No, I, I, I think that um, there's about to be a great reconnection with the hard wall of physics and the hard wall of biology and endocrinology. And people have, yes, yeah, said what they've said, but as a result, we're now in this, I will call it a pandemic of metabolic illness. Yeah. And, you know, one of my thoughts is that, you know, people get tired of being told that, you know, when they followed the advice that they've been given and haven't gotten the results they were promised and they go back to the people that gave them the advice those people say well you're lying right well most people get tired at some point of that the right. lucky ones those like myself who were exposed to people like michael and mary dan eads who heard this other message okay now we have a personal experience so what I hope we can do is multiply the personal experiences. And if you're anything like me, as you go down that path, you begin to look at all these other things and go, whoa, okay, I'm seeing connections here. The same people that are telling me that, you know, I shouldn't eat meat are the ones that are flying their private jets all over the place in the name of, okay, well, you know, don't, I don't want to hear anything more from you about that, especially as I learn what the actual impact of livestock agriculture actually is. And then I learn what the impact of metabolic illness is on the environment. Right. And, and so I, I you know, I, I am becoming increasingly optimistic that if we can get our message in front of people in a way that's effective. I don't always do that. Sometimes I can't resist, you know, the, the, the really, you know, witty remark or whatever that in hindsight wasn't the best thing to say. Um, but, you know, we, we are in this issue of malnutrition globally. And, and one of the things that frustrates me is some really smart people that I work around or with or know of they're doing work on food systems or they're doing work on other systems part of you know economics or whatever but they're stuck in the paradigm that says that obesity is the result of overeating or sedentary behavior and so they will say look how good things are look at how good a job we're doing when obesity is this huge problem that means there's so much food that people aren't malnourished anymore they're overeating and what i hope we can get them to understand is that obesity is a symptom of malnutrition right we okay. we're pro we're producing a lot of calories we're not producing the high quality diet and it's not available for whatever reason, whether it's personal choice or economic necessity or what have you. It's not available to people in sufficient quantity. And that's what we have to work toward. And, and, and so I've been advocating for something I call the ruminant revolution. Yeah, I'm leaning heavily on the green revolution. I'm saying we need, if we're going to meet these goals for the next 27 years, we have to improve the productivity and efficiency of ruminant animal agriculture globally, right? Humanity's existential crisis is insufficient animal source food in their diet. Right? We have really good, hard, high quality scientific evidence of human beings being harmed by too little. And the whole mythology, sorry, there's my judgment, the whole message about too much is based on the weakest quality evidence that's available. And that's not debatable. Everyone knows this in the guild and outside. We just have to get more people, I'm sorry, not outside. Within the guild, they acknowledge this. Outside that guild, they don't talk about it too much because that would be confusing. 
right? <laughs> and so we, we need to get people to understand all of this. And again, I think it starts with encouraging people to, you know, eat more animal source food. You know, make sure you're getting sufficient protein. Don't worry about the fat that comes with that protein. Avoid the sugars and the grains, right? But don't restrict animal source foods. You're not going to kill yourself in a month, right? Try it. See how you feel. And if you feel better, why wouldn't you keep doing that? I mean, there's this idea of we're going to somehow do penance for some sins that we've done against Gaia. It's all this modern sort of thing. And if we can like just sort of get people to step back, have a personal experience, maybe that'll open them up to more conversation. And then we can start feeding them some more information or making them aware of where to go get it so that they can become increasingly comfortable following a lifestyle that benefits them and their families. You know, that all sounds great on paper. But then there's reality. Mm -hmm. When parents tell me things like, this is what my kid brought home from school, this is what they're serving at school. These are institutions that these kids have to go to. When I get people, you said, try it, see if you I've had people lose, I'm not making this up 100 pounds. They'll go back into their doctor and the doctor will go, my God, last year you were here for your physical and you've lost 110 pounds since last year. What did you do? I stopped eating grains. Well, what else? I started eating more meat. Oh, God, you need you need to stop doing that. You now have mm -hmm. a healthy person, a healthier person walking in and the doctor's telling them that thing that got you here, you need to stop doing. I have mm -hmm. these consults with people daily, Peter, daily. Mm -hmm. I do consults five days a week. And this is one of the phone calls I get. Hey, Vin, I've lost weight. My doctor's not happy with my diet. Now what do I do? Mm -hmm. And I can't go against any doctor's recommendations. Right, right. right. I'm not that kind of doctor, right? On the right. other hand, we can ask, you know, and not everyone is equipped to engage with, you know, the their doctor. Right. But but their doctor is not their boss. Their doctor is not their uh, I, whatever, you know, <laughs> you are going to the doctor for them to serve you. And I am amazed at some of the conversations I hear about. I'm not denying it, but maybe part of what has to happen is the doctors have to become right sized. Now, now we're really getting crazy. Right. Yeah. But but people need to understand and have converse, hard conversations with people. What do you think this drug is going to do, right? What, what is the marker that you're most interested in, right? The doctor is concerned. Right. Well, okay, so where am I now? What are you concerned about? Now let's have a conversation about that. How many people have we spoken to who say, my doctor's really concerned about my cholesterol? And you ask them, what's your you know what numbers right what metrics and they don't know right now okay it seems at least appropriate to know what that number is that your doctor is so concerned about so that you can then look into it more so we've ab individuals have abdicated their responsibility um you mentioned schools that's probably the most effective point of political activity is to get involved at that local level, right? And say, why is this happening? And, you know, one of the things is people think that they are operating from solid, you know, ground, right? That they have evidence that supports what they're doing. We all like to believe that. So then the question is, could you show me the study that supports and then you can have and and not everyone is prepared to do that, but we ought to be able to to at least do what we can. OK, and so in this house, we're going to eat this right. I will send this to school with my kids. I understand the economic necessities of many people, and that's why you know, folks like Nina and others have to get that sorted. I'm working in the area that I'm working in because I know that's where I'm equipped for. Right. And, and I am interested in bottom up, 
right? There's another way to attack it, for, and, and it all has to happen. But I'm convinced that if we get enough people, then the market responds, right? Right. I mean, the, the... Oh, and, and by the way, I've been yelling about that a lot lately. You know, the market responds by saying keto friendly, keto certified, keto, yeah. all things that are not keto, low carb or healthy for you. is just a label on because the government, again, allows them to put these lies on the front of packages and un, you know, winning people will go and look at it and go, oh, wait, it says keto. Or why right. can't I have this? It's like right. because it, you know, you could put keto on a bowl of sugar and call it keto. It, <laughs> there's no government agency that that's that's looking at that. Yeah. And, and by the well, way, let, yeah. me, let me take it one step further, Peter, and, and I want you to comment on this. I saw the other day, um, and by the way, this is not meant to be political because I don't do politics on this show. I don't care if you're far right, far left, in the middle. I don't care. I just care about people. Uh, but MSNBC uh, did a thing, and you might have seen it online. They ran a whole story saying that staying in shape is a right-wing thing, and mm -hmm. eating red meat is right-wing. And I'm looking at that going, how can you, yeah. how can you do that? How well, one, way, that? one way to look at that is they're really getting desperate, right? That, that – uh, you know, one of my favorite pictures from last year was from Germany, where they're discovering that their whole energy policy over the last decade or so has been hopelessly misguided, something that anyone with an elementary education could have predicted. Um, and so here's a picture of them having to tear down a wind farm to get at the lignite underneath it. So they can strip mine the land underneath it, right? Lignite is the dirtiest, nastiest coal there is, but it's what they have and they need energy. And so this, you know, Germany is deindustrializing. This is, as I said, the, the hard reintroduction, you know, to the wall of physics. Right. You, you, you can, you know, facts are stubborn things, right? And so we've been on this far too long denial and, and yet, I see evidence everywhere of people coming to understand that this just isn't going to work anymore. It never did. There was never the good information to support it. Right. Um, and, and people have to be introduced to that. I get it. But I'm also convinced there's a whole lot of people that never believed it in the first place. Right. Right. right? So, so it's not like we've got to reeducate everyone. And I hate that phrase. Um, but, you know, and, and it's not only in the high income countries, right? This is a global phenomenon. And, and so I've been spending time learning about the, the statistics of malnutrition globally. I mean, the, 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 the World um, uh, Health Organization, WHO, says that the best source of the essential nutrients for proper development in children aged six to 24 months is meat, eggs, dairy, seafood, right? That's what the WHO says. It's in a footnote, you gotta dig to find it, right? But then UNICEF says that almost 60% of children globally don't eat meat, eggs, dairy, or seafood, right? So we've got somewhere between a fifth and a quarter of children globally five years and under being stunted. Right, right. We've we've got almost thirty, almost a third of ch uh, preschoolers in in UK being anemic. What's that from? Well, the lack of meat in their diet is one significant problem. Right, right. And and some people do that for economic reasons. And yes, we have to. You know, I've heard it said that ninety five percent of the world's vegetarians are economic vegetarians. They're not philosophical vegetarians. Um, so that that's a key issue, and there's a whole lot involved in that. But one of the problems, again, is this this mythology has infected global development efforts, right? And so that has to get sorted. Um, meanwhile, I see some really encouraging work where people are studying systems where livestock are integrated into the cropping systems. And so the one example that I keep using is from Brazil, 
<clears throat> where they're growing soybeans as the cash crop. Yeah, there's something we could talk about there, but that's what they're doing. So, okay. And then when that's either close to the end harvest of that crop or right after harvest, they plant a winter annual forage crop for pasture to graze stock or cattle on cattle that have been weaned and you want to put a couple hundred more pounds on them. Right. Okay. So because the soybeans is the cash crop, that's conventional thinking where you put the fertilizer. But what these people said is what happens if we put the fertilizer on the forage? Because over 90% of the nutrients that a grazing animal consumes go back onto the field. Right. So you, so what they did was they did that. They ended up with more forage produced. So they got more beef produced. They also got the same soybean yields as they did pr previously. Plus you got whatever benefit came to the soil from having that more dense, more vigorous winter forage annual grass growing there with the roots and all that soil health benefits. So we're seeing more and more of those things happening. And then, you know, the people that entertain this idea that it's either or, right? It, it, it just, it speaks to their ignorance. So, and, and I, I, I mean, ignorance in the uneducated definition, I, I right? Know. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, so, you know, people think that when we talk about agricultural land, that that's land that's suitable for tillage to produce annual crops. And it isn't. The term we use for that land is arable land. And so all arable land is agricultural, but not all agricultural is arable. Okay. And so the one example that I got last year, and I've been using the heck out of it, is imagine that the land surface of the earth is within the boundary of a soccer field. Okay. Okay. Now, your agricultural land would not even make it to the center circle. Okay. Your arable land would only make it to the penalty spot within that penalty area. Right. And as one man said, yeah, and the spots getting closer and the goalies getting nervous because by tilling land, we're losing arable land degradation. We're developing it. You know, just look at how urban sprawl eats up agricultural land that's happening globally. So people are imagining that we can produce crops, but they don't have an idea of the land that isn't available to do that. And then the other side of it is all agriculture is basically manipulate man and manipulating his environment to produce biomass more than the natural environment would produce. Right. right. And so e the vast majority of the biomass that's produced in agriculture is not human edible. So somebody did a study and they looked at, you know, for a kilo of vegan food in Europe, it would produce four to five kilos of inedible biomass. Wow. What are you going to, what are you going to do with that? Oh, we can feed it to ruminant livestock and produce meat and milk deal. Okay. You know, I, I, one of my lines is you can't make milk. You can't get milk from almonds, right. but you can get it from almond hulls. And that's what they do in California. They feed a lot of almond hulls to their dairy cows. And, you know, so, this integration and and i can out here in western oregon we grow a lot of grass seed in the winter you'll see a lot of sheep grazing those seed fields so now you've got animals grazing a crop during its natural normal cycle you know southern great plains they can graze cattle on wheat pasture and at some point decide do i want to just graze it until it's done or do i want to pull the cattle off and still get a wheat harvest from it for grain you know, corn belt, there's a lot of corn stalks, you know, and residue that gets eaten after harvest. And so this integration has always existed. It looks different in different parts of the world. But the idea that we can have a sustainable food system without livestock is as incorrect as the idea that we can flourish on a diet devoid of animal source foods. Peter, you mentioned uh, Brazil and what they're doing there. Um, I'm writing down a note here because I want to ask a question about this. Um, 
you mentioned Brazil and what they're doing, and it seems to be working. Why wouldn't the United States or Western Europe or some other, you know, first world country pick up on that and go, wait a minute, they're doing it there. Why don't we give it a shot? We don't have to do it everywhere. Give it a shot. Take X percent, take 5% and try it and see what see if it works. Why aren't we doing mm -hmm. that? Or, well, or some of that's yeah, some of that's already happening, right? So um, there, there are communities of researchers that have been working on this for decades. So then, you know, as one friend of mine says, if you've got a solution that nobody's using, you might want to look at the solution, right? There might be a really good reason. I guess the other version of that is before you tear down a wall, know why it was put there in the first place, right? right? And so we could change some of the fundamental drivers of our current agriculture and that would affect change but under the current situation people are doing what they're doing for viable reasons everyone is you know it's that that's part one of the things that is is a challenge because if i have um a a, a, a you, you know similar land equal parcels and i got a fence between it and Two different people own it. They're two completely different operations, right? Now, with some commodity crops, that difference gets a little less because certain decisions, once you make them, everything else follows, right? But with, you know, livestock, especially ruminant animal livestock, there's a lot of questions that come in. So one would be, you know, is the, guy, is the family on one side approaching retirement and the other one just getting started? Well, they've got two different priorities at work there, you know, as far as risk, as far as access to cap, all those things. So, you know, there's, there's, but part of what I've been trying to uh, help people understand is there's been a lot of people who have been really interested in conservation and grazing management for many decades. And again, we haven't been good at telling those stories to a population that's increasingly divorced from agriculture, ranching and farming. Right. And, and, and so part of what I, I, I've been trying to do is, is, like I say, build these bridges, you know, b bring people into the forage, you know, um, uh, councils that I'm a part of, or the, the grazing lands coalitions, or the animal science groups, or what have you, to tell each other, or to talk, learn from each other. And, and I really think that that's the way to go. Well, you know, I'm, I'm optimistic, but I'm not naive, right? right? But what else can I do, right? I know this to be true. And I know so many people who I've had conversations with who said, wait a minute, you, you just said, and I'm going, yeah, that's what I said. And they go, but that's not what I've heard. And I said, yes, I understand. And so then they say that that's helped them, you know, in their practice. So when I tell people, I'm not interested in label claims, you know, I'm not interested in the keto registered trademark or, you know, the, the regenerative registered trademark or the this, that and the other. I'm interested in people buying what they can afford, what they enjoy eating, what's accessible to them and seeing their health improve. And that can be, you know, the, the chub of 80, 20 hamburger that we just bought some for less than two bucks a pound right. at Safeway and lost liter eggs. And that's a whole lot of nutrition for not a little, not a lot of money. And you can make a dramatic improvement in your health eating that. And on, in these days, I think that that's a compelling message as well, right? And so as, as people go and they hear that, some people have come to me and they've said, you know, thank you for that, because now I don't need to feel guilty about telling people that they should, you know, go buy grass fed when they can't afford it or, or whatever, you know, and, I'm, and so cool, Let, let's rack on. No, look, I, I'm the same way. People say, oh, you know, you, you know, it's pretty elitist of you. You're telling people to eat meat all the time. It's like, I always say to them, I sometimes buy, you know, those big chub rolls of ground beef for my dog. And they're like, whoa, Mr. Rich guy's like, no, I'm not rich. <laughs> but if you do the pounds per versus dog food, mm -hmm. it's cheaper. 
-hmm. this stuff, this human food is cheaper than what you're feeding your dog. I will mm. buy one of those big two, three pound chub rolls for my dog, right? Because it's cheaper than dog food. And there's, there's, there's more bioavailability in that versus some crappy dog food. Right. Mm -hmm. And when you put it that way to people who go, really, I can eat it. Yeah, 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 you can eat meat that cheap. And yes, you don't have yeah. to have grass fed and grass finished. And you don't have to, you know, you get what you can get and you do what you can mm -hmm. do. I, I want to change the subject just a little bit. I didn't really follow this story. I just saw it online back and forth a bit. And people wrote to me on Twitter and said, oh, did you see this? And I'm like, oh, I don't, I don't even want to go look. Where they were going to kill a ton of cattle, and I want to say Ireland or one of those. Well, countries. yes. So, so the there name, are three countries in the name of saving the planet. Help me with this. Yeah, it's it's uh, again part of a belief system. It's part of a false narrative. The belief, you know, Ireland could disappear completely, and I'm pretty sure their total emissions are within the confidence interval for the global estimates. In other words, it would make no difference, right? right? But, and so we, we see that, we see it happening in the Netherlands, we see uh, attacks and some other efforts taking place in New Zealand market forces that are harming hill country farming because it's being replaced by trees, which are being planted for carbon credits. I mean, this whole thing is having massive unintended consequences. The, what we have to do is we have to get the best information in front of policymakers. And frankly, what's happening in Europe as a pushback <laughs> politically is going to get their attention. It already has. Um, but you still have some lunacy taking place. And, you know, the, the, the whole subject of energy and that is one that I'm learning more about. I can refer people to experts that I've learned a lot from. Um, but it, it's one of those critical issues for modern societies. And so Ireland, unfortunately, is governed by people currently who, um, let's just say they're poorly informed. Um, you know, it, it, the, there's that line about if an honest man is shown to be in error, he either ceases to be in error or he ceases to be honest, right? So let's let's show them the information and then see what they do um and yeah i i have that front of mind for myself too right because we can all do that if we're not careful um so i i'm, I'm really trying to what i you know spread what i think is good news there's there's a lot that we could get disillusioned with but at some point people begin to pay attention to you know, the fact that what, what is the spend on medical that is essentially treating metabolic illness? It's off and, the charts. I mean, as I always say, Peter, we're breaking into the weight of our own weight. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, we, we now, you know, and, and here's a way to look at it is um, we are saddling the next generation with a crushing amount of debt yeah. because we won't have honest conversations. And one of those honest conversations is, you know, when it gets to it, our medical care system is in fact a luxury. We yeah. don't have to have it. Right. And, and arguably given the number of people that die every year due to medical error or hospital contracted infections, the best thing you can do for your health is stay away from the medical system. Yeah. Right. But but in other, you know, I'm really grateful for that acute treatment. Like if I break my leg. Right. I'm really grateful that there are, you know, antibiotics to treat infections that I don't have to die of a rose scratch. Um, you know, and there's a long story behind that one. But and, and I think Mike Eads just said this in wrote this in, I think, his latest edition of his newsletter that people get all concerned about things they can't control and they give up what they can control. And for most of us now, I'm aware of, you know, economic reality and I'm aware of what goes on in other parts of the world. And that is what we have to work on. 
But for most of us, we have a tremendous amount of choice about what we put inside us. Right. Right. In this country, at least. And and so for people to, you know, engage in this kind of kabuki theater about saving the world when they don't know what the actual impact is, when they don't know the reality of the essential nutrients that they have to have and the harms that come and then the environmental consequences of metabolic illness itself. You got really close to a point that I try to make to people when you said, you know, that's really elitist and whatever, whatever. A version of that that I hear is, well, we can't feed the world as much meat as whatever. And I turn that around and I say, no, we must. We must find a way to feed the world the, on a diet that contains the appropriate amount of animal source foods. It's going to look different in different cultures, right? I get that. But, you know, it, it, that's what we have to do. Otherwise, people aren't going to be able to develop to their potential because their brains won't develop properly because they're not getting the essential nutrients, right? And, yeah. and, and the fact that we're seeing that in high-income countries because of choices people make because they think it's right while at the same time you know there are people in low and middle income countries who just can't do it they're physically restricted from it so um that's part of the messaging as well and maybe we can just shame them into changing if we can't educate them well look I, you know I, and again it sounds political but it's not you know in, in the last election cycle for president um <clears throat> Well, the, the right knew that they were going to be running Donald Trump. So we paid attention to the left who had the big primary, right? And one of the guys in a primary was uh, this guy, Cory Booker, mm -hmm. who I'm sure is a great politician. I, you know, I'm, I don't know much about him, but he started talking about we need to get meat out of school. We need to get rid of meat. You know, mm -hmm. if he was president, he's going to make it mandated meatless this, meatless that and the whole thing. So I went, hmm, Corey is a smart man. What's what's this agenda? So I went and looked him up. Sure enough, really smart guy. But he's a vegan, right? He's a member of PETA. He's a member of this. I went, oh, okay, I get it now. And yeah. he's the chair of the Senate Ag Committee, isn't he? Uh, I didn't know that, but okay. Um, yeah. But I'm looking at this going, okay, I get it. This guy, you know, he's, you know, <laughs> he's got a bat and everything looks like a ball, right? You know, mm -hmm. you know, they say if you have a hammer, you start looking for nails. Mm -hmm. went, okay, I get why he's doing this. But he started pushing that enough. And one night I saw Kamala Harris being asked a question by a reporter. Cory Booker thinks it's a good idea to get rid of meat and, uh, you know, cut down on this and do all this stuff for the environment. And what would you do? And Kamala goes, yeah, I think that's a great idea, too. I, I like Meatless Monday. I like doing more, less meat and getting rid of these cow farts and the problem that's causing the, the world to go to hell. Yeah. And, I'm, you know, the reason I bring up Kamala in this is because she is now one heartbeat away from leading this country. This is a woman who has these. Now, I get it. If she becomes president tomorrow, I'm sure that's not going to be on the agenda. Right. Right. But and, and, and you know, she they believe what they believe. I also believe that there's a certain amount of money that comes to them because they state those things. Right. Right. And so money drives politics. We understand that. Um, on the other hand, you know, they haven't seen the information that says that if we were to eliminate animal agriculture from the United States, we would only reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the United States by 2.5% or less, 0.4% right. globally, but we would imbalance the food system and we would exacerbate essential nutrient deficiencies, right? right? So that they, they have heard the lies or the misstatements Sorry, edit. Um, just kidding. Um, and so if that were true, okay, get it. There's, there's lots here for us to help them understand better. We could start with 
what does malnutrition look like in your community that you're that you're purporting to represent and we can pull that information we can show people that you know there's the urban rural divide when it comes to metabolic illness right we 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 have billions and trillions of dollars that are going into a failed model right right we, we've now documented drug-free remission of type 2 diabetes right so that's a thing do they know that and and are you willing then in your profession of being able to push back against the power are you willing to channel challenge pfizer and eli Lilly and whoever else benefits from you know the the market for drugs that primarily are aimed at type 2 diabetes right the you know what is it about americans that make us think that what is it weco v or Ozempic or you know, Rigovi and Ozempic. But here's the thing, Peter. I, you know, we could sit here and 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 think about this and talk about this, but the fact of the matter is, as I tell everyone, you may not know this, but people become representatives and senators. That's not a high paying job. That's a right. low paying job. Most of these people go in broke, but they come out very wealthy. Where did that money come from? <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I've always said that, you know, because I played D1 college football, and I, I always say to people, you realize when you're on a D1 scholarship, you're not supposed to get money from anywhere. You're an amateur athlete. Yet you watch these college quarterbacks, they, they you know, they're walking into the stadium in a Brioni suit and <laughs> a Mogli shoes. But they well, don't now that they have money. rights to their their name, right? They're, so that's changed a little bit. But you know, I get okay, it. Yeah. In the past two years, but when uh when that was happening three years ago or maybe it's two years ago, I can't remember when it changed it. Where was that coming from? I was watching a thing that was showing, um, um, it was called The Swamp, where they showed the Florida State team back in the day when, um, when uh, what's his name, was on the team. He's walking into the stadium in $3,000 worth of clothes. Where did that come from? Where did mm -hmm. any of these guys go? I said the same thing about politicians. They don't make enough money to live in Washington, D.C., Real estate, I live near that. That real estate mm -hmm. is expensive. Mm -hmm. Not only do they live there or have apartments there and have a house somewhere else, they leave office wealthy. Where did it come from? came from the drug companies. It came from mm -hmm. the drug companies. It came from the food companies. And as I tell everyone, it comes from the NRA, one of the biggest supporters of the left and the right. As I tell mm -hmm. everyone, look at things. Things don't make sense. You know, the left complains about guns in the NRA. Does any rule get ever gets changed? Ever, mm. ever. Mm. The last time we saw any legislation at all on the NRA was after a president was shot, and it was the Brady Bill, because Brady was injured for life, and they pushed through a Brady Bill that meant nothing. Mm. And that was done under Republican regime, right? Mm. So if you don't think the left has taken as much money from the NRA as the right is, you're nuts. You're right. you're on crack. So so it, it at some point, you know, else. back back to the point, the politics needs to start local if you're going to have an impact, right? But how many people even know who their representative is supposed to be? So, you know, who are they going to listen to? The people that show up in their office all the time. I get it. I'm like I say, I'm not naive. On the other hand, is there a better system somewhere <laughs> is is you know i i hear proposals and frankly you know i know where my people came from a couple hundred years ago i'm really glad that they came here um you know one of the interesting things and this is uh, trying to you know signal a change um but you know we have this mythology that a hundred or however many years ago we ate a lot more grain right this is food supply data and it, it it's you know, there's a there's a problem with it. But when you look at the accounts of people who visited colonial America, right, and they traveled around and they visited, you know, places, they were astonished at the amount of, you know, fish and poultry and game and that we were eating multiple times a day. Right. And this is there any wonder that our stature increased over our ancestors, right? Height, not girth. 
and and we then achieved the 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 distinction of being some of the tallest people in the world and that's been regressing over the last several years right after the war, war after the second world war the netherlands made a really concerted effort to promote dairy consumption and as a result they're really tall people Huge. now that's reversing yeah <laughs> You okay. go there and you see six foot two women, not just one or two. You see them all day long, mm -hmm. right? Women, not to mention the guys. Yeah. So, well, so what a coincidence, you know, they were emerging from a period of famine, right? Okay. So, so these examples aren't unique and they're not isolated. Um, you know, we, we have the benefit of being able to impact individual people, right? So, and, and I guess that's part of it too, is I haven't been thinking about, you know, the affecting policy change. I'm not saying that's not needed. I haven't been thinking about affecting politics and policy that's needed. I've been thinking about, you know, you know, I, I'm going to miss the quote, but I heard somebody recent, you know, instead of the, the march through institutions, we're going to reverse that, right? And it's going to happen one person at a time. Right. And, and, and so, you know, people who, you know, so what do you need to answer the concerns that somebody brings to you when they say, you know, you know, my, my, you know, my family is talking to me about the damage to the environment or about animal welfare or about whatever that falls within the realm of a forage agronomist, ruminant nutritionist to answer or can introduce you to people who have dealt with things like ethics in consuming animal source foods. Or, you know, here's one, there was, just, there was a study, didn't get a lot of traction, gee, I wonder why, where they demonstrated that your emissions from a wildlife dominated savanna and a livestock dominated savanna are essentially equal. Wow. Okay, so we have to have, if we're going to maintain savannas, and it's really important that we maintain grasslands, there are most endangered biome, far more than rainforest, far more of it has been lost. That's the corn belt, right? We, right. Okay, so in order to maintain the health of those biomes, they either have to be grazed or burnt. I'd rather graze them. So you're going to graze them with wildlife. You're going to graze them with livestock. It's the same. Now, our mindset in all the conversations as if, you know, it's it's somehow a zero somewhere and livestock only add to emissions rather than the emissions that would have been present from a natural environment. And right. now, of course, we've got the whole rewilding nonsense and all of that. Just focus on your health, improving your health, That'll improve the world. And if you have questions about these other things, we may have answers, right? Not, and I'm not saying we don't need to get better at doing things. Absolutely. But if we don't know that we're already sequestering more carbon in the United States than is being emitted by agriculture and forestry, right? Already right. those are carbon negative. It's the only industry that's carbon negative. <laughs> so so if we don't know that how can we have a meaningful conversation and by the way it's burps not farts right the the methane that comes out of a cow i know you know this but I don't know, but it sounds funnier to say fart oh i love a good fart joke just as much as the next guy yeah but mint learner comes in here he goes you know it's burps right it's like come on come on <laughs> and it's, uh, we get it we get it I love that guy by the way do you know him at all oh absolutely yeah, he's yeah. a good guy. Um, yep. Peter, um, I want to close up by saying, because I got to get to another podcast, I could talk to you for two hours at a time. Mm -hmm. You're you're retired now. So what are you doing? Where can people find you? I know you're not going to stop in your retirement. No. You're, you're yeah. just ramping up here. Where can yeah. we find you? What can we do with you? How can we use you to our advantage? So yeah, thank you. Um, as I've told 
colleagues, Don Pedro has not retired. Um, <laughs> and, and I intend to maintain uh, efforts. So there's a couple things. Um, you know, I'm still on uh, appearing at metabolic health conferences. Just spoke in uh, San Diego. I'll be speaking at uh, Low Carb Sydney in October. Um, you know, I'll be speaking at a National Hay Association conference in Bowling Green in September. Um, in November, I'll be at an integrated cropping livestock system symposium in Brazil. Um, they have decided in that organization, they were already into soils, crops, and animals. They're adding humans as okay. one of the aspects. And yes, we had something to do with that. That was one of those breakfast conversations I'll value until I die. Um, so I, I'm going to continue doing that. I'm the current president of the American Forage and Grassland Council. Um, I'll be past president starting in January. Um, the, the International Grassland Congress that just took place, its theme was grasslands for soil, animal, and human health. And, you know, I'm pushing for the Centennial Congress, which will be in 27, to include some significant conversations about metabolic health. Um, 2026 is the International Year of Rangelands and Pastoralists. That's a UN initiative. And so it's an opportunity for us to talk about how when these pastoral people are displaced, they no longer have access to the animal source foods that they require, their health degenerates, as well as the health of the biome that they're forced off of. You know, so there's lots of those opportunities I intend to you know, get material into the scientific literature to push against the narrative, um, to, to get people to stop thinking that there's such a thing as too much animal source food. Um, and, you know, I just gave some testimony to the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee on why it needs to um, uh, follow the current science when it comes to protein recommendations, right? They're, they're, they're at least they're at least 10 years behind the science when it comes to how to talk about protein in the human diet. You know, the, 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 the phrase amino acid only appeared four times oh, in the dietary guidelines. And each time it was in the same title for the same reference, they were citing in tables of caloric intake. So, you know, they're, they're still saying that protein from plants is equivalent to protein from animals. They're still thinking that crude protein is a useful metric, right? So all of that, tried to get that information to them, and I'll keep doing things like that. I've, I've got lots of social media presence. People can find me. Um, I'm, not, I'm not hard to find. You know, Nina was here at the house a couple of weeks ago, and um, she, we had long conversations uh, Serena sat in on a bunch of them. And one night, Nina and I pulled out the booze and just sat back. And <laughs> that was probably the best conversation we ever had. And, um, you know, I, I started thinking, what if, because your name came up, Gary's name came up, Mitt Lerner's name, Frank Mitt Lerner. And I was like, what if we could get, you know, we all go talk, we all go talk to to the general, but we go to these low carb this and low carb that thing. But what if we cut out the audience? What if we could and think about this, because mm -hmm. I'm curious about it. Mm -hmm. What if we did a think tank? Mm -hmm. Me, you, Nina, mm -hmm. Gary, you know, Frederick Lacroix, uh, Frank Mittler, mm -hmm. um, you, you know, Ian Felt, I could go on and on. Uh, uh, um, Eric Westman, mm -hmm. get a room. You know, for like a weekend, we all meet at yeah. a resort somewhere or Yeah, I'll serve you all coffee. I mean, I just I just dig that real. <laughs> you, you, you know what I'm it's like if yeah. we all got in a room and we talked it out and we had someone taking the minutes of these conversations so that we can just a think tank of everyone because we we're all off. As I, I told Nina, I said, Gary's off writing books. You're off getting yelled at. I'm off getting yelled at. You know. What if we can all come together once a year for a weekend and and just put it on the table? And but we have the minutes of that because mm. we're just sitting there just saying this needs to be done, that needs to be yep, done. Yep, yep. And see if yep. we can come together so that we can affect change 
on a bigger level, maybe not yeah. global at first, but nationally. Sure, right? sure, 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 sure. Well, well we national will do the global because it influences. Right. Here, here's an. What county do you live in? I, I'm in. Um, I, I'm in um, Albemarle co County in Virginia. Okay, so in your county is a county extension office, right? Cooperative Extension Office. And you as a citizen have the right to go in there and get information on a variety of topics. Some of it will be free. Some of it will be for some minimal charge. They have cost recovery and things like that. But it's, you know, and so you can find out all kinds. They have a program to teach you how to garden. You know, Master Gardener is a thing. And there's even a Master Livestock program in some areas. And there's all these, there's over 3,100 counties in the US that includes Alaska and Hawaii. Every one of them is served by at least one office, oh, right? Wow. So now if you go in and you ask them for information about diet, you're gonna get the standard, I understand. But one of my projects is sort of getting people involved in their extension office and forming relationships, get to know the people, let them get to know you, right? I mean, it's the same thing that we would do with any sort of friendship. And over time, I think we have an opportunity to bring in all of the good science that we know about and push it up the chain to the land grant universities, which would include the historically black colleges and now the, the tribal colleges and universities, right? All of those are now that and the 1862 land grant universities. So mm -hmm. Virginia Tech for you. All of those are part of this system and it's supposed to work two ways. And we can come in, and this is a, one of my thoughts, and it's in the early stages, but we can come into a county and say, these are the statistics for diabetes and metabolic illness in your community, right? And this is what we could do, you know, if we had some people that were willing to come in and deploy a program. And who do you contact? And what's the, you know, we know we can produce a positive result. We can right. document that. That like drives funding. That drives awareness and attention within that system. And that's a huge multiplier, right? Yeah. So, so this is one of the things that I intend to become um, involved in. But your idea, please, um, you know, if, if you only need a housekeeper, I'm willing to sign up for that one. I, I you would be one of the key people there at the first summit, you know, and we just have to figure out you know, find the place that's, you know, not cost prohibitive, you know, we all come in on our own dime, mm -hmm. and, uh, somewhere in the middle of the country. I mean, people like, um, uh, you know, LaCroix and some of these guys, um, Ian felt that I mean, it'd be a, a big, big deal for them, you know, coming from mm -hmm. Europe. But I, I think it needs to be done, we need to get the right brains in the room. And I would be more yeah. than happy to narrate. Oh, I hear Great Barrington Potter is a location. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> He's here all week, folks. Well, let's yeah. see. Put him. No <laughs> way. <laughs> there we go. Um, folks, we're gonna we're gonna make that the final word. Um, go find Peter Ballastat everywhere. We're gonna put I have a whole host of things we're gonna put in the show notes so that you'll know where to find him. You know what to do with me. I do consults all week long, every week. You can sign up for a consultation. Go to vinnytotteries.com, click through that link, and you'll be able to sign up. Also, we have the, the NSNG ebook that's there. And look, before you go to Amazon, go to vinnytotteries.com, click through the banner. It puts coal on the fire, it gets my train down the track. I was having so much fun with Peter, I forgot to stop and tell you guys about Villa Capelli. Still the longest running sponsor of the show, Villa Capelli Olive Oil. Um, let them know we sent you. Put in promo code Vinny for 10% off your entire order at Villa Capelli. It's the only oil that I can guarantee is 100% pure olive oil, no seed oils mixed in. Villa Capelli, longest running sponsor of the show. Promo code Your Vinny. favorite fruit juice. It's my only fruit juice. Not only my favorite, my only fruit juice is olive oil. And my favorite of all the fruit juices is Villa Capelli olive oil. So go check that out. Villa Capelli. Let them know we sent you. 
on behalf of Peter Ballastat, my name is Vinnie Tortorich. Put life into living and do it with enthusiasm.